So uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We just stop reading there. Uh, the need for salvation. Uh, last week we looked at the subject of sin, and that's the need for salvation. The Bible says we're, we're all sinners. We're born sinners. The, the first verse here in Ephesians 2, he says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, we're, we're born sinners because of Adam. We, we inherit that, that sinful nature. The Bible says uh, the wages of sin is death. Yeah, death came upon our world and we're, we're subject to it. But one of the things I want you to understand about salvation, salvation has always been God's plan. You know, it wasn't that Adam and Eve sinned, and God said, oh, no, what am I going to do now? <laughs> you know, God knows. In fact, in, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, uh, several verses that, that make this, this statement, Titus 1 verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God promised salvation before the world began. You know, he created us knowing that we would sin, knowing that we would rebel against him. But he loved us and he, he had a purpose for us. It wasn't an afterthought. And the Bible says that, that as we read here in Ephesians chapter 2, God's plan is by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And grace, someone has taken the letters of grace, G-R-A-C-E. It makes a tremendous uh, Understanding of salvation, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a good way to remember salvation. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's grace. And uh, God planned this uh, right through time. In uh, 2 Timothy 1 and, and verse 9, he says, talking about God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. See, God's plan of salvation was put into motion before he even created the world. God knew that he would come, and Jesus would come and, and be our Savior. And he did it because of his love. God loves us. 1 John chapter 4, well, John 3.16 is a verse that most people know. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In 1 John, he says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the covering for our sins. Because of his love, God has always planned for us to have salvation available to us. You know, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm so glad that we're not just an afterthought to the Lord. God made us on purpose. God made you on purpose. He has a purpose in your life. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to have fellowship with him. Uh, you know, so one of the things that people wonder about sometimes with salvation is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've heard people make some pretty strange claims uh, depending upon uh, on their views. But you know, 
salvation before the cross in the Old Testament, it was still by faith, it was still by the blood. And that's important for us to understand. Now the difference was, before the cross, they were by faith in the coming Savior. Jesus hadn't come yet. The sacrifice hadn't been made. And in a sense, sins were covered. In, in Leviticus chapter 16, it's an interesting book, uh, it's an interesting chapter, I should say, because Leviticus 16 uses the word atonement 16 times. <laughs> and the word atonement basically means covering. Uh, in the Old Testament, our sins were covered. Looking forward by faith to what Jesus would do. In, in Leviticus 16, 6, for instance, it, uh, Aaron said, the Bible says Aaron offered a bullock uh, for a sin offering, uh, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Later in uh, Leviticus 17, 11, he says, it's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. But th there's some verses in Hebrews that I want you to see. If, if you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews really helps explain the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hebrews 10 and, and verse 4. Before the cross, our sins were covered. Uh, people were saved by the blood. They were saved by faith. But uh, there was a, a difference in that Jesus hadn't come yet. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Uh, verse, um, verse 11. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Before the cross, the sins weren't taken away, but they were covered. They, they were trusting the blood. They were trusting by faith. But they were looking forward to something that was going to take place at the cross. And that's the, the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, after the cross, sin was taken away. Hebrews 10, verse 12. But this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You know, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. Both are salvation is still by faith, it's still by the blood. But in the Old Testament, they were still looking forward to that one permanent sacrifice. You, you know, those priests in the Old Testament, every day they offered sacrifices. Over and over and over. Different priests would come and go. You know, I find the Bible's humor kind of interesting. Uh, he said the priests couldn't continue because they, basically, he said, because they kept dying. <laughs> we don't allow dead priests to, to minister. <laughs> uh, they just kept coming and going because, you know, time went by and they would offer the sacrifices. But you know what? When Jesus came, once for all, the Bible says. Right. And that covered the sins past, present, and future. In both places, salvation is by faith and it's by the blood. But when Jesus came, sin was taken away. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5 it says, and you know that he, that's Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is, is no sin. Uh, salvation, it's, it's so important we understand uh, how God works salvation. It's by the blood. It's by the blood of Jesus. They could picture it, but only Jesus could offer the real, permanent, perfect sacrifice. And that's something that's important to understand about salvation. Salvation's price is that God's son had to die. That's the only way it, it would work. And that's God's, that's God's estimation of it. We, the Bible calls it the gospel. You hear that word, the gospel, a lot. <clears throat> they misapply it sometimes. But the gospel is basically the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Bible describes it as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the gospel. The good news, that Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again in victory over sin. God's son had to die. In Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> we'll turn to a lot of different verses. You can turn or you can just, just listen. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. <clears throat> the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That was Adam. 
And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. When the disciples were preaching about salvation, they said, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Only Jesus, only God's Son, could be that permanent, perfect sacrifice. And the Bible says that Jesus suffered for the sins of the whole world. And that, I mentioned it already. That means past. That means present. That also means future. When you get saved, when you trust Christ as your Savior, your sins are gone. Your sins are forgiven. Now some of them, I'm sorry to report, but even Christians sometimes sin. Even pastors sometimes sin. Hey, but our sins are forgiven. Now we need to keep short books with the Lord. We need to recognize our sins. But they're already forgiven when we trust Christ as Savior. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18... Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ died once for sins, once for all. Now, when we sin, you know, when you trust Christ as your Savior and then you say or do the wrong thing, Christ doesn't have to die again. He's died for that sin. It's covered by the blood. And you know, nothing else can pay the price. We sing the song, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's exactly right. In Titus chapter 3 and, and verse 5, <clears throat> the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us. See, it's not by works of righteousness. <clears throat> Religion is basically the idea that we can kind of try and work our way to heaven. You know, a, lot of, a lot of religion has this idea of a you know, balance. If I do more good than bad, then I'll be okay. God says, there's none good. There's none righteous. He says, our righteousness is like filthy rags. Sorry to be gross, but that's a description of bandages of a festering wound. Ooh, not very nice. Some of you are nurses. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, nothing else can pay the price. Our righteousness is, is not enough. We read in Ephesians, for by grace are you saved, through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, so much religion is works-based. Pay your money, do your time, do this ceremony. The Bible says that's, that's a hopeless way. God's way is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not by baptism. It's not by a ceremony. It's, it's not by an experience. I've talked to people who have had some amazing experiences. Let me tell you, your experience will not save you. I don't care if you saw God standing at the end of your bed. That will not save you. In fact, it will probably keep you from being saved. And the Bible says Satan can appear like an angel of light. Be aware of that. Uh, it's the blood of Jesus. Uh, I don't know how close you are. But look in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and, and verse 13. <clears throat> Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, that's salvation. He describes this before and after salvation. Uh, dead in our sins, then made alive in Christ. And look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Uh, our sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. But look at verse 16. This is how we're not saved. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You know, there's a lot of religious things people can do. He says, that's, that's not the way of salvation. 
It's not keeping holy days. Later on, he says in verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. You know, a lot of religion is based on false humility. I, I remember meeting a lady that was telling me how humble she was. And I said, you know, you should write a book, Humility and How I Attained It. Yes, I should. She said, <laughs> you know, humility is not something you brag about. Uh, there's a false humility that people uh, think will get them to heaven. God says, no, worshiping angels. Listen, you can meet 12 angels. Uh, it won't get you to heaven. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he says, there's a, there's a false way. Don't go that way. There's only one way of salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Salvation's price was God's son. That's a big price that God paid. It's no wonder he can say, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't give either one of my sons for anybody. <laughs> but God gave his only son. And he did it because he loves us. What a blessing. Well, salvation does a work in us when we receive it. When a person trusts Jesus Christ as, as their Savior, Christ saves them from the penalty of sin. Now, this is the most common thing we think about with salvation. Salvation means you're saved from hell. Now, growing up, to me, hell was a curse word. Uh, personally, I think it still should be. You need to spell hell with a capital H. It's a place. Same with heaven. And salvation saves us from what we deserve. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. I deserve it right now. I don't deserve another day of opportunity. But God loved us so much that he made a way for us to be saved. Salvation saves us from the penalty of sin. He says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, there's a verse in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 21 where he says, For he hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ became sin for us so that we could become righteous through his, his salvation. Our, our sins are forgiven. The penalty is paid when we trust Christ as Savior. Uh, God says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's what we want, peace with God. Christ saves us from the penalty of sin. Salvation also saves us from the power of sin. Now, most people don't think of this when they think of salvation, uh, but it's true. Uh, it, look in Romans chapter 6 and, and verse 17 and 18, if you have your Bible there or just listen. You know, we think of being saved from hell, but we forget that when we get saved, God also says we're, we're set free. Romans 6 verse 17 says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered. You're saying, you got saved. You believed the Bible. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. See, salvation sets you free, not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. Before salvation, you were a servant of sin. That's why we do what we do. But when you got saved, you became a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Now you're made alive in Christ. Now, I've always heard this example over the years, and I think it's a good one. I've never had to train an elephant, but I'm told that if you want to train an elephant to stay in one place, you start when it's as little as you can get it, a you know, little, little elephant, and you stake it down. Put a thing around its leg and a stake in the ground, and it's little, it can't get away. Well, then when it's as big as a barn, he still thinks he can't get away. This little stake, and man, he could pull it out easy. But he's so used to that thing uh, limiting him that he stays. And you know, that's the way a lot of Christians are with sin. They're so used to sin being the master that when sin pulls, they oh, I got to do it. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you know, as Christians, we've been set free. We're not servants to sin anymore. Man, pull that stake out. Uh, go on for the Lord. Uh, I always remember, I worked at a restaurant. I've told you this many times, some of you. Uh, I had a boss. A boss. She, she wasn't very nice. And uh, she was kind of hard to work for. And when, when I went away to university, I quit working there. But uh, 
my mother still worked there. And when I, when I came home for Christmas, they needed somebody to fill in. I had a very important job, you know, as the dishwasher. And uh, so they, they needed somebody at that very technical job to, to fill in. So I went in, filled in. It was a Saturday. And uh, she said, now, I need you to work tomorrow. I said, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not working tomorrow. It's tomorrow's Sunday. Well, if you want to work here, you'll work tomorrow. I said, I don't want to work here. I just filled in to help you out. <laughs> you see, she was no longer my boss. I didn't have to work there. I chose to go in. Now, that's not a very good illustration, is it, when we're talking about sin? Don't choose to go into work for sin uh, as Christians. God has set you free, not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. There's a verse, we're going to get to it on Sunday nights, uh, probably next week or the week after, 2 Corinthians 2.14. It's my favorite verse about victory in Jesus. You know, we sing the songs. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Isn't that a great verse? Always causeth us to triumph in Christ. There's victory in Jesus. Salvation does a work in us. It's not just words. I remember a lady saying, yeah, I, I, I said the words and I went home and told my husband, he said the words too. <laughs> and he's talking about getting saved. I thought, man, uh, I don't know if there's been much of a heart change there. Uh, salvation, not just words, it's a relationship based on a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and what he's done. Victory in Jesus. We're saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the power of sin. Someday we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. Jesus is going to come and, and, and take us home. In fact, in Hebrews, he puts it this way. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And we're going to go home to be with him. And man, sin will just be a, well, we won't, it won't even be a memory. It'll just be gone. Uh, aren't you glad? Salvation. Salvation's work in us. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And let me close by telling you salvation's cost to you. You know, a, a salesman, you always, you always have to get down to the price, don't you? It's free. You say, hang on, I've, I've been offered free things before. Uh, let me tell you, if somebody offers you something free and it costs, it's not free. Jesus offers salvation, for by grace are you saved. That means it's a gift. Free to you, great cost to him. And you know that the preciousness of the gift, the price that's paid does make a difference, doesn't it? I remember some friends of ours were saying, oh man, you, you go down to the thrift shop and you can get some great gifts. <laughs> but you know, we don't always just want to give something that we're going to throw away. God didn't do that with us. God gave His Son. God gave the very best He had. There's a song, I think I can remember it. He says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Listen, that's the price Jesus paid. The sins of the whole world laid upon him. Past, present, future. Your sins. And let's be honest. There's times when we purposely sin against God. We know it's wrong and we choose to do it anyway. We've all done it. There's other times. I know there's times when we, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. Or, you know, we're influenced by someone else. But we're sinners at our very heart without Christ. And God still loves us. God commended, showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we're shaking our fists in his face, in, boy, I love that Bill Bramblett. Not, by, not because I'm a good person, but because he wants me to be his person. And you know, with any gift, the thing you need to do is to receive it. It's as simple as that. And the problem is, people think because it's free, it's cheap. But let me tell you, uh, you give your heart to Jesus. You receive the gift of salvation. It'll change you in ways you never thought possible. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, boy, I never thought I'd be doing this. <laughs> uh, somebody gets saved and, and pretty soon they're doing something they just never imagined that uh, God would allow them to do. You know, the Bible says, uh, there's a man in Acts 16 where he, he asked the disciples, what must I do to be saved? 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. In John 1.12, he said, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, there's a believing and there's a receiving. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as many as received him. I often use the ABCs. A, admit that you're a sinner and need salvation. God says all have sinned. B, believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again. He's the only Savior. Believe the gospel. And C, call upon him to save you. To save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, salvation is so simple. Uh, it's so, uh, such a blessing for us because uh, God paid the price. God gave his son. Salvation is a free gift of a holy God to a sinful world. Uh, it's obtained only by faith, believing on God's son and receiving him into our heart. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't deserve it. And salvation is a personal decision. No one can do it for you. Your parents can't save you, children. Uh, baptizing infants will not save their souls. Now, there's no ceremony that someone can do to you that will cause you to have a relationship with the Lord. But let me tell you, it's good news. It's the gospel. And you can be saved, and the Bible says you can be saved and know it. Because it's not by your works, it's by His. Now, there's so many verses, Romans 1, verse 16, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Yeah, what a blessing uh, that God offers us Salvation. Salvation changes the heart and life of everyone who receives Jesus. You see that over and over in people's lives. God says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. It makes a difference. And you know, the Bible says we can't be good enough. I mean, how good would we have to be? There's just no, there's no standard there. God says we've all sinned. He says that his grace is sufficient for what we need. There's a verse I love, Philippians 1.6, where he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God gives you the promise that if you'll trust him, he'll keep you. He'll, he'll never let go of your hand. And what a blessing it is uh, that we can, we can know the Lord. As I was uh, thinking about this message this week, uh, one of the things I, I do is I, I think, well, what song do we want to end with? Now, if you have your, your songbook, we're not going to sing this song, but you're welcome to look at page 189. It's a song of testimony. Now, I wanted to just read it to you. I'm not going to sing it. Talking about salvation. Like I said, this is very simple, very basic. Um, it's the theme right through Scripture. Uh, the blood, faith in the Lord through Jesus Christ. Well, here's a person uh, and their testimony. Oh, how well do I remember how I doubted day by day. For I did not know for certain that my sins were washed away. When the Spirit tried to tell me, I would not the truth receive. I endeavored to be happy and to make myself believe. When the truth came close and searching, all my joy would disappear. For I did not have the witness of the Spirit bright and clear. If at times the coming judgment would appear before my mind, it made me so uneasy. For God's smile I could not find. But at last I tired of living such a life of fear and doubt. I wanted God to give me something I would know about. So the truth would make me happy and the light would clearly shine. And the Spirit give assurance that I'm His and He is mine. So I prayed to God in earnest, not caring what folks said. I was hungry for salvation. My poor soul, it must be fed. When at last by faith I touched Him, and like sparks from smitten steel, just so quick salvation reached me. Oh, bless God. I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, for I know, I know it's real. I hope that that's the, the faith you have in Jesus Christ this morning. Not by works. Listen, works will cause you to doubt, because you'll never know if you've done enough. Not by goodness, not by religion but by Jesus Christ. Listen, you know there's enough when it's Christ. His grace is sufficient. That means more than enough to cover you and me and every person who'd come to him. And he makes this, prom this promise, I'm sorry, 
He says, if you'll come to him, he'll in no wise cast you out. I don't care who you are. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. You know, when you really understand your heart before God, you'll see yourself a sinner. But God says he loves you and he'll receive you if you'll come to him by faith. Salvation. What a simple message. God knows what we're like. He knows we need a simple message. And today, I would encourage you, if you're not sure about eternity, listen, there's people who are in eternity today who didn't expect to be there yesterday. And depending upon what they have done with Jesus, it's where they'll spend that eternity. The Bible says now is the accepted time. It says we have no guarantee of tomorrow. You do have this guarantee. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why not, why not now? Let's bow our heads and, and go to the Lord in prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you're feeling really uncomfortable. That could be the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart. Father, thank you so much that you know us and you still love us. God, there's so many different stories here today, and yet you know each one. And Lord, you made us for a purpose. You sent your son to die for us. Thank you. Lord, I pray if there are those here that are not saved, Lord, help them to trust you today. Help them to trust you now. Lord, just to cry out from their soul, God, save me. Lord, bless us as we, as we sing and as we're dismissed. We pray this in Jesus' name. We're going to 